The story begins with the news as being broadcasted on the topic of a tower called Babylon whose 40th floor has an undefeated monster. The news shows us how the Black Dragon Guild sets out to raid the 40th floor but fails to defeat the boss monster. Then a hunter ranks number one after he single-handedly defeated the boss monster. A reporter interviews him and addresses him with the nickname the Flame Emperor, but he seems to hate it and reacts negatively to the nickname. Online comments drop in, as the whole world watches the news and people start saying different things. Some commenters begin to gossip about the Flame Emperor dating another hunter called the Saintess, but a S-rank hunter named Kim gong Ya keeps commenting the same thing over and over again I want to become like the Flame Emperor. However, the reporter asks the so-called Flame Hunter to respond to the aspiring hunters. He says that in the end, those who are destined to succeed will succeed and after they succeed, they shouldn't start a beef with him or else, they will die. The words of the Flame Hunter affect Kim gong Ya and it makes him furious that he starts to cry. Suddenly, a skill card appears before him as a compensation for the envy he has for the Flame Emperor. The skill card contains a skill that is greater than his current S rank. The golden card means that he copies the skill of the enemy that kills him and makes it his. He shouts what kind of skill is this. The tower is seen to have appeared suddenly in their world and it can be seen from any horizon across the world. Different floors of the tower have different monsters from another world. Those that first entered the tower when it appeared were chosen by the tower and they gained special skills but those that heard the rumors later on only entered the tower to hunt down the monster. The words of the Flame Emperor still affect Kim gong Ya negatively and he finds himself in a bar. The news of how skillful the Flame Emperor is being broadcasted in the bar. gong Ya doesn't feel the vibe and he asks the bar manager, can we watch something else? gong Ya begins to freak out and he complains about his new skills. He tells the bar manager that he can't even report it to the Hunters Association because he thinks the skill is crap. The bar manager quickly tells him to vomit outside after he wants to throw up. He leaves the bar shop and he keeps thinking about everything until he sees the Flame Emperor and his alleged girlfriend, Miss Saintess, arguing by the corner, so he lures around and he listens. The Flame Emperor claims to have poisoned Miss Saintess after she has initially tried the same on him. The Flame Emperor holds the antidote that can cure her as leverage so he asks Miss Saintess to confess whoever has sent her to kill him. He asks her if it was the black dragon who sent her but she didn't talk so he burns her. Kim gong Ya perceives the fire illumination and he couldn't help it but goes out of his hideout and shouts murderer, psychopath, and he runs away. The flame emperor gets hold of him and because he has seen what he has seen, the flame emperor kills him. Kim gong Ya then wakes up in a strange realm and he sees a command that asks him to select a skill card. Then the skill card mysteriously copies out the, the flame emperor skill. However, he wakes up in his room as the news of another black dragon guild's failure casts. He wonders how he gets to his room after Yusuha, the Flame Emperor, killed him. He checks the skill card details and he discovers he has been sent to 24 HRS before his death. However, he figures out he has copied that skill from the Flame Emperor. Kim gong Ya then realizes that the Flame Emperor must have died due to the poison but he came back 24 HRS prior, and that was how he knew what Ms. Saintess moves were. He then hears a fire outbreak outside. He goes outside and he sees that people are gathered, different guild members come to the scene waiting for the Flame Emperor. They try to quench the fire with water but all is in vain. Kim gong Ya knows the Flame Emperor actually set the fire in order to cover his tracks. The Flame Emperor then arrives and he begins to praise himself. He asks for what rewards they will give him if he stops the fire. gong Ya gets tired of all the Flame Emperor's bad attitudes and he decides to kill him. He enters the fire to buy himself another 24 HRS back in time. He dies by the fire and he returns 24 HRS prior to his death. When he returns, he finally understands that no matter how much he tries to kill the Flame Emperor, the Flame Emperor will still return to 24 HRS before 2 since they both have the same skill. He then figures out that the Flame Emperor's first awakening was 11 years ago, June 7th, which means his permanent death can only be met 40-45 days ago. So he decides to kill himself 40-45 times. He keeps stabbing himself and keeps waking a day backwards. gong Ya finally gets to the present day that the legend of the Flame Emperor begins and he moves out to kill him. He first observes all Flame Emperor movements by dying 10 more times. Each time he dies, he uses the opportunity to study the Flame Emperor's whole lifestyle. Having known his daily movement and routines, he starts to execute his mission. He times him throughout and he finally gets to him on the sixth floor. He disguises as someone in need of urgent help as he comes out of nowhere saying he got attacked by wolves. gong Ya offers him 20 gold to buy his portion but the Flame Emperor complains of his ruined hunt, yet he wants to buy his portion for that cheap price. However, out of Yusuva's greediness, he extorts gong Ya and he collects all the money he has, without giving him the portion. He even turns back and decides to kill gong Ya since he knows for himself that he has wronged him. As Yusuha tries to kill gong Ya, what he never expected was a comeback from him. Well, gong Ya rises all of a sudden and stabs him. 
Yu Su Ha dies with a shock and in the end, Gong Ya feeds him to the wolves. He changes his cloth from the blood-soaked one to a new one he has hidden in the ground and he leaves to transfer to Floor 1 City. He comes across a vigilante corps who seems to be unaware of anything and the news also says nothing of Yu Su Ha, then he drinks beer recklessly. He is very happy that the terrible legend of the Flame Emperor is no more as he flaunts his new skills and credits. Suddenly an old man walks in, requesting vodka and sugar in warm milk. Gong Ya looks at the old man suspiciously. The old man is the rank 1 hunter in this era and Gong Ya thinks of how skillful the old man is. He continues to plunder that dying in the hands of any hunter means he will be able to copy their skills, even the skills of the current rank 1. Still in the bar, the old man, also known as the Sword Saint Marcus Callenberry, starts to talk to himself and somehow it feels like he's referring to Gong Ya. Following that weird moment, Gong Ya gets terrible and on messages on his phone about the Sword Saint. In these messages, Gong Ya learns of a word that should never be spoken to the Sword Saint. To buttress the message, a short story is being narrated on how the Sword Saint reacts to a group of hunters on the Floor 9 hunting grounds where he strikes them after they made mention of his grandchildren in a mockery way. An advisory message which says if you don't want to die, don't talk about his grandchildren in front of Sword Saint pops in. All the messages are nothing but a big surprise to Gong Ya. Sword Saint, King bores everyone in the bar with his attitude. He later leaves the bar and Gong Ya follows him. Gong Ya keeps wondering the kind of awesome skill the Sword Saint will have if Yu Su Ha has such an amazing X rank returning skill. He follows him, but the Sword Saint already knows he's behind me. When they get to the bush where nobody can see what is happening, the Sword King turns to him suddenly. Plot twists Gong Ya asks for his favor and he begins to say words Gong Ya doesn't understand. He finally accuses him of murder after he claims to have seen the number of kills on his head. Gong Ya begins to think about Yu Su Ha as his only kill but turns out Gong Ya has actually killed 4091 people, the Flame Emperor and himself 4090 times. This is the number of kills the Sword Saint can see. This terrifies the Sword King and he attacks him. The Sword King sways his sword and Gong Ya dodges it. He trips and falls to the ground as the Sword King further talks to himself. Gong Ya begins to think that the Sword Saint is sharing his information with other people and that will make him very notorious and everybody will come after him and they will hang him eventually. Gong Ya figures he has to die to copy the Sword Saint skills then he says words that pisses Sword King the most in his life to him. He speaks ill of Sword Saint grandkids. The Sword King beheads him immediately. Gong Ya dies and he goes back to the realm of skill acquisition where he will pick one of the skills of the Sword Saint with the golden card just as he did with the Flame Emperor. He then begins to have difficulty in selecting a card because there is no golden card just silver and bronze cards. He finally picks a card and he beseeches the card to give him the skill behind the Sword Saint's success. Sword Saint's skill is then being copied and he returns back to life. He learns that he doesn't have the main Sword Saint skill but he has an A plus passive skill. He opens the skill card afterwards. He suddenly hears someone talking beside him on the same bed and he doesn't know what is happening. Gong Ya hears the words of this strange guy as he talks about Gramps to go and train if he wants to train. He replies to this strange guy and when he looks at Gong Ya, it shocks him too because he used to be with the Sword Saint. He asks Gong Ya if he can see him and he says he can. This strange guy is actually a ghost but can only be seen by whoever has him as his skill. Gong Ya eventually discovers he copied the Sword Saint's skills of having a ghost around him which only him can see and talk to. That explains why the Sword Saint has been talking to himself all these while. Ghost then screams return me back to the Gramps right now. The ghost starts to freak out that he is in the company of a kid who even talks anyhow to him. He starts to blame the Sword Saint for not being responsible enough until a random kid clones him to himself. Gong Ya talks about the Sword Saint seeing the kill count of his head and the ghost disbelieves him instantly. How can an amateur like you kill that much? The ghost asks. Gong Ya explains how he earned that number of kills and how ends up in the current era and his will to die by the Sword Saint's hand so he can copy his powers to become the number one hunter. The ghost hears him out and ends the conversation by asking Gong Ya to let him see him hunt some monsters. They go to the hunting ground and Gong Ya begins to kill monsters. The ghost finds out Gong Ya doesn't have any remarkable hunter's talent but his no fear for death makes him spectacular. Ghost exclaims that the sword saint also has another version of him on his side. He would like to see who gets better between Gong Ya and sword saint. Ghost begins to like him and he claims to help him get better than anyone else and he wants Gong Ya to take over the tower. The ghost shouts at Gong Ya to wake up and he requests for 5 minutes. The ghost insists that he rise up from bed and when he manages to rise up, he discovers it's still 4am in the morning. They begin to quarrel and the ghost calls him zombie ass mother since he just doesn't die. However, they go out and they discuss as they walk. The ghost criticizes Gong Ya for lacking talents and he somehow makes a gesture of him. Later, they go to give and take, a monopoly on the tower's economy owned by the rank 3 hunter called Countess. Her cheat skill makes it possible for users to trade with the outside world. 
Gongyo speaks to the attendant who wears a cat ear cap. He requests for his lottery winnings. The attendant gets shocked when she collects Gong Yao's identification slip and she sees 53G. She goes to call the manager straight away. The manager comes and tells Gong Yao to follow him to the upper floor and when they get there, he shows him his 53-0 gold. He however gives him a choice to either take the money or save so he decides to save it. He then decides to buy Sang Ryan's honorary guild member title. Gong Ya doesn't belong to any guild on the tower yet so he decides to join one because he figures out that the Flame Emperor rejected every guild thereby making enemies of large guilds, and they eventually tried to poison him. He also asks the manager to get him a better apartment. He finally asks the manager to conceive his identity if any news outlet asks who the first place winner was. Gong Ya gets everything at give and take under control and that impresses the ghost. Gong Ya and the ghost walk along the city and the ghost advises him to either read scrolls of martial arts or get portions to boost his physical abilities. The ghost then recommends that he get the portion instead and he suggests a store they can get it so they head there. The sword saint passes by and Gong Ya quickly hides behind a trash can. The Sword Saint enters the same shop they want to get the portions. Since the Sword Saint is around, it becomes suicidal for Gong Ya to enter the shop so he figures out another shop and they head there. As they go through the slum, the people around see Gong Ya talk to himself and they think he is crazy. When they get to the shop, they witness how the alchemist is being blamed for owing for long and all her instruments and portions are being taken away. The alchemist pleads with them but they turn deaf ears on her. The alchemists stand in the middle of the road helpless. She tries to get people to buy her portions but they complain about how expensive her portions are. Gong Ya then goes to her and he tells her he wants to place an expensive order. The alchemist gets the biggest shock of her life when Gong Ya mentions 20k for the portion he wants to order. The pharmacist invites Gong Ya into her shabby shop and he asks him to place his order. As they speak about the price, the pharmacist makes it clear she won't take the order if it's drugs. Gong Ya reassures her it's not drugs and they continue to talk about the order. The ghost whispers the ingredient for the portion to Gong Ya after the pharmacist asks him for it. He tells the pharmacist simultaneously as the ghost tells him. However, the ghost still doesn't think the pharmacist is competent but as soon as she explains how to mix the ingredients, the ghost starts to feel her. Gong Ya and the ghost then leave her shop and they discuss her expertise. Gong Ya spills out that he actually did all that because she becomes the head honcho of the alchemy castle 10 years later. After 4 days, the pharmacist delivers the portion to Gong Ya. Out of curiosity, she asks Gong Ya why he patronizes her despite her falling status and reputation. Gong Ya thinks of what the pharmacist becomes in the future and the way she smartly despises the Flame Emperor. He replies to her and says he only orders from her because she is a kind woman and he wants her to succeed. The pharmacist leaves after she tells Gong Ya if he has anything else to order, he should call her and she will prioritize his request. Gong Ya and the ghost then go to the third floor hunting ground of the tower to test out the portion, and he drinks it. He gets terrible reactions from within and the ghost teaches him how to master the elixir in his system. As they talk, monsters arrive and Ghost tells him to run. Gong Ya stays back and decides to fight the monster orc. He doesn't know how to kill the monster exactly but he runs around listening to whatever the ghost instructs. He gathers aura to his feet, and this makes him have high jump power and he jumps to strike the monster. He lands on the chest of the monster and he slays the monster. But the monster's skin is so tough that his blade can't penetrate. The ghost then tells him to gather his aura on the tip of the blade so he does it. He finally kills the monster after several noob attempts because he hasn't meditated yet on the use and control of the aura. Due to this, he feels too weak after slaying the monster. The effect of using an aura without meditation is a total body weakness. He feels too weak and he dies by the hand of another orc monster. He returns back to the realm as usual and the ghost follows him there. He explains to the ghost that he comes to the realm whenever he dies and he gets to copy the skill of whoever kills him. It shocks them when they discover the monster orc also has skills. Gong Ya observes the skill cards and he wonders which one might be the best one to select. Unlike Gong Ya, the ghost can see the kind of skill each card has because he is a ghost who can fly around. Gong Ya happily asks him to read the skills to him so that he can select the best one. Made easy, the ghost reads the skills and Gong finally makes his selection. He copies the TCH weak skill a skill that can be used to trick an orc monster to become vulnerable. After the selection, he wakes back up in his house 24 HRS prior, and he decides to go back to the hunting ground. Gong Ya does everything as he wishes and that really worries Ghost. Ghost decides to train him to master the aura for 6 months but Gong Ya turns it down and heads to the 3rd floor to kill some monster orc. He uses the TCH weak skill to trick the monster and the moment the monster becomes vulnerable, he strikes him down. The ghost complains about that cheat and they set to enter the 4th floor. A week later, they get to the 5th floor and Gong Ya kills the Goblin King with the Gorok skill. It appears Goblin King is the strongest enemy Gong Ya will kill that week. 
After killing the Goblin King, Gong Yao levels up and his skill slot expands. He becomes an E-rank hunter right away. The ghost then starts to lecture him about the shape of aura he will possess by what effects show up when he levels up. He talks about the Flame Emperor and the Sword Saint aura traits. However, Kim Gong Ya even wants more challenges and he aspires to go to the 10th floor. He then bets with the ghost that if he clears the 10th floor successfully, the ghost must start to call him Gong Ya politely. The ghost has been calling him zombie ever since. The ghost tries to discourage him but he insists and manipulates the ghost. People stare at him as he talks to ghost and they conclude he's insane. When he gets to the entrance of the 10th floor with the unseen ghost, the guard denies his access. The guard complains of the failure of the strong black dragon guild master and its members. He refuses to see any possibility of a low-level hunter hunting solo he even calls the mission, suicide. Gong Ya then fabricates lies and he tells the guard that he recently lost his lover and the alchemist even told him he has an incurable illness and he would die soon. He pleads with the guard to allow him to enter anyway and die honorably as a hunter since his life will come to an end soon. He butters the bread of lies by even giving the guard some money and he gains entrance. The guard eventually lets him enter and he goes into a building for the 10th floor challenge where many fire-emitting dolls await him with a hide-and-seek game invitation. This chapter takes us back to the news about Black Dragon Guild 30th time failure being broadcasted and the Black Dragon claims they had bad luck, but then the Flame Emperor says luck is also a skill as he has just cleared the 10th floor. Gong Ya relates how the Flame Emperor cleared the 10th floor and claimed he was lucky, whereas his skill was Fire Aura, meaning the fire of the 10th floor can't affect him. Gong Ya accepts to play hide and seek with the fire dolls. He has to find a single real doll and destroy it while the time counts down until the fire burns him. Once he picks a doll at random but it isn't the real one so it melts off. Gong Ya stands clueless while the time counts down. As soon as the time is up, the fire blazes angrily and it burns Gong Ya to death. He returns back to the skill acquisition realm and he reminds the ghost of his promise to call him by his real name Gong Ya not zombie. He asks the ghost to read out the skills to him. He doesn't go with the ghost opinion as he chooses the skill he thinks is best. He chooses a skill that allows him to figure out the real doll, not the one that makes him overcome the fire barrier. After he selects the skill, a penalty occurs due to the skill. The trauma of the monster fire maiden recreates. Gong Ya begins to see orphan children in another world begging for bread and getting rejected by the people. Then comes a man who seems nice and decides to take this particular orphan away to safety. He takes the little girl to a house and he cages her. Turns out the man is actually a bad man and he claims the innocent orphans are plagues to their society and they should be eradicated. They sacrifice these young orphans and kill them. The ghost also joins Gong Ya in experiencing this bitter trauma. However, the ghost doesn't feel as bad as Gong Ya feels. Suddenly, still in the trauma experience, the house the orphans are being kept goes on fire, and the evil workers begin to run leaving the caged orphans behind. Gong Ya witnesses every last evil that was done to these orphans and the trauma ends. When he wakes back up 24 hours prior as usual, he becomes very moody, and the ghost says words that even make things worse for him. As they approach the 10th floor, Gong Ya says he'd rather save the doll than destroy it. The ghost starts to freak out because saving the doll is clearly not the way of clearing the 10th floor. However, Gong Ya figures out that the only way to clear the floor is to play with the dolls because that is actually what they want. He plays the hide-and-seek game with them and in the end, he finds the real doll and he successfully clears the 10th floor. Gong Ya feels moody and somehow depressed after clearing the 10th floor about how wicked the world is. The ghost begins to praise him afterwards and then suddenly, fireworks shoot up in the sky. The news that the 10th floor has been cleared overtakes the atmosphere and people start wondering who just cleared the 10th stage. Numerous messages drop in on the net, all aimed at pointing out who actually cleared the 10th floor but no answer is being obtained. All the top hunters are definitely not the 10th floor clearers they are found doing something else. Suddenly, the 10th floor gate guard runs towards Gong Ya to confirm it but he tries to hide his identity from him. He eventually let the guard know he was the one who cleared the 10th floor. Gong Ya then reminds the ghost of his promise to call Lord Gong Ya if he clears the boss in two coins. Gong Ya goes to a cafe and he keeps talking to the ghost about his victory until a cat goes to me and he takes the cat. Afterwards, some guild leaders come and they confirm his identity. Immediately they discover he is Gong Ya, they begin to bid him with different prices to join their guild. The cat he picks up during the conversation transforms into the Countess and she offers him the biggest amount. After the low-level guild leaders get outmatched by the Countess, they excuse themselves. Then rank 5 guild leader, Viper, barges in and criticizes Countess for bidding Gong Ya quickly. Rank 4, Heresy Inquisitor also walks in. Rank 8 and Rank 2, Paladin and Black Dragon respectively join them as well. Turns out the top rankers actually know one another and they criticize the Countess for offering 50k gold. 
as they rant. Heresy Inquisitor suggests that they should all order coffee first before they settle the matter. They all place their orders and they sit round a table to discuss. They first talk about how skillful Gongya is to have Solo cleared the 10th floor. Black Dragon then asks Gongya to join a guild afterwards. Black Dragon explains the importance of becoming part of a guild to Gongya. She continues that the outside world needs hope about the tower by learning about the leading guild and its achievements. Also to make the tower adventurous, he has to join a guild. They explain why they need his identity open to the outside world so that it can restore hope for the first floor hunters and also creates an avenue for the world generally. Gongya then decides to join one of them by playing a card game with all of them. Whoever wins gets to have him in their guild. They all consider Gongya's decision to be fair and they accept to play with him. He plots with the ghost to peep on their cards eventfully. The ghost agrees without hesitation since Gongya assures him of no more calling him Gongya. The ghost goes behind all the top rankers and exposes what they plan to play to Gongya and he effortlessly wins them in all the rounds they play. Some of the top rankers begin to lose their minds. As they play and lose to Gongya, they get fed up and they leave the table one after the other. Viper accuses him of cheating after he won over 30 rounds they played. Viper gets tired of losing and he leaves to meet the Heresy Inquisitor. Now it remains Gongya, Black Dragon and Paladin. Paladin loses next as well and she leaves the table. Now, it remains just Gongya and Black Dragon and Countess decides to distribute the card for them. As the game goes on, Black Dragon narrates her story to Gongya and the audience says wherever one comes from doesn't matter to the tower. As they play the final game, they both stake higher and they discuss more. They talk about the tower and its challenges. Gongya talks about his affinity for the tower and Black Dragon compliments him. They finally come to the end of the game and Gong Ya wins. His objective of not joining any guild is finally met and he ends the meeting with his zeal to excel to reach the 100th floor without making enemies with anybody. He permits them to expose his identity if that means good to the outside world. He then leaves the cafe after he tells them the 11th floor will be open soon. People gather around waiting for the opening of the 11th floor and they talk about how the media leaves them clueless of who cleared the 10th floor. Kim Gong Ya in the top. Rankers are also present. Time counts down and just on the verge of opening the 11th floor, Gong Ya name is being revealed on the net. A hologram appears above them and speaks to them about the 11th floor. The sword saint jumps to the top of the building and he transfers first to the 11th floor. Other hunters begin to transfer and Paladin engages Gong Ya in a conversation. She does that so as to bring people's attention towards him, the ghost suspects that as they talk. Suddenly the meteor rush towards Gong Ya and that's when he discovers Paladin has exposed him. Paladin then transfers to the 11th floor leaving Gong Ya behind to battle with different questions from the media. Gong Ya manages to say something to the media before he transfers too. He tells them well, word hard, everyone. Happening on the 11th floor is a great battle between the Kingdom of Egypt and the Demon Army. The hunters find themselves suddenly in the middle of the battlefield. The hunters transfer to the port of the Ejim Empire where monsters raid and the commander of the empire fights courageously. The hunters remain clueless of their objective on the battlefield. The Ejim commander sees them and he beseeches them to bestow their blessings upon Ejim. Then the monsters start to attack them as well. Sword Saint immediately beheads the monster and they begin to fight alongside Sword Saint. Gongya stands confidently in the battle without fighting any monster and he starts to receive floor 10 rewards. Displaying before Gongya are valuable skills rewarded from floor 10 to allow him to navigate floor 11 to 20 easily. He gets the location skill and he chooses the leadership skill. He puts the location and the leadership skill together to bring about an ultimate skill. Gongya has never led an army before so he plans to acquire that skill from the Ejim commander. However, he goes to the NPC commander Sarba's Ejim. He manipulates the commander to kill him. He fabricates lies that get the ghost speechless. He tells the commander that if he dies, the god of war will bless the battlefield. At first, the commander does not welcome the idea of killing a hunter from another world but then, Gong Ya persuades him closely, and he concurs. The commander kills him eventually and he copies his skills. Gong Ya dies and returns back in time to 24 HRS and he gets back to the battlefield. He is then seen to be riding with the soldiers with a special sword in his hand. Gong Ya starts to lead the army to victory on the battlefield. He has been dead previously, meaning he has repeated the day and he has learnt one or two from what happened and how. He gives directions to the commander in order to locate the demon army's general. He checks the map and he tells the general to make certain turns. He appears in the battle with the Egypt's Empire legendary holy sword. Legend says that a goddess gifted it to the founder of the Egypt Empire. Before history became a legend, the founder went missing and the holy sword also vanished. Then the goddess leaves behind a prophecy that when the faithful day arrives, the one wielding the holy sword shall also arrive. The one who possesses the holy sword of protection will receive absolute trust and support from the people of Egypt Empire. The soldiers see the sword in Gong Ya hand and they begin to hail him. 
Together with the help of the Holy Sword and the Minimap as a gift for clearing the 10th floor, Gong Ya leads the army purposefully. Other hunters watch as Gong Ya rides with the commander and they wonder why he is the only hunter in that position. Gong Ya listens to their babbling with the aura and the ghost criticizes him for abusing the aura. He leads the army throughout the battle and he tells them to charge towards the main forces. As they clear their way to the Demon King, they finally see the Demon King and they charge towards him. Gong Ya jumps up and he activates the Gorok skill in the air. He then slays him and they win. After the victory, the armies rejoice and they give thanks to the goddess's hero Gong Ya. They all chant Long Live the Empire. The hunters hunt down the remaining goblins and they kill them all. With this, floor 11 has been cleared. The raid participants are therefore being assessed and ranked. The rank displays and Gong Ya tops the list. The hunters wonder why he doesn't have an alias and they even wonder how the sword saint came second on the list. Gong Ya and the ghost then have a silent conversation. Gong Ya tells him to admit that his skill is amazing but the ghost refuses to acknowledge that. He promises the ghost that he will learn some swordsmanship before he clears the floor 20 then the ghost starts to feel himself. However, the commander arrives and he thanks Gong Ya for the bravery he displayed. He asks him to have his deepest gratitude. The commander narrates the prophecy of a demon king's arrival and heroes from another world coming to save the kingdom but he says he was actually skeptical about the prophecy. He then shakes Gong Ya. The final rule of the floor 11 then displays and it says until the top contributors are given their rewards, the remaining participants are banned from entering floor 12. As Kim Gong Ya transfers to the 12th floor, the ghost warns him about meeting the sword saint there. The ghost says that the sword saint will come at him like a madman. Gong Ya then tells Ghost that he has his ways. Arriving with him is Heretic Inquisitor, who praises him for what he did back on the 11th floor. As they converse, the Sword Saint tries to strike Gong Ya but Heretic Inquisitor blocks it for him. She asks the Sword Saint why he is trying to attack Gong Ya. Sword Saint refuses to tell her why he wants to kill Gong Ya. Sword Saint then threatens to cut off one of Heretic Inquisitor's arms if she doesn't move. The moment she hears that from the Sword Saint, she uses her skill to teleport Viper and Paladin to the scene. They jump at the Sword Saint but he defends himself. Viper had to wonder what the old Sword Saint eats to keep him that strong. Viper starts to lose focus and Paladin cautions him to focus on the fight in front of him. Heretic Inquisitor then asks Countess to give her 20k gold. Countess eventually gives her and she does her holy techniques on the gold. She brings about the Celestial Clan Master and they all face Sword Saint. Black Dragon also joins them because Gong Ya has previously had an agreement with the five guilds. Black Dragon says if the Sword Saint must kill Gong Ya, then he has to first go through all of them. At that moment, Gong Ya communicates with Ghost with his mind and he reminds him of the words he said on floor 11. There are two ways to fight against a strong opponent, one is to have enough raw power to crush an army by yourself and the other is to raise an army yourself. He reminds the ghost because right now, the five guilds are the army he has raised should in case the sword saint tries to kill him. Gong Ya then talks to the sword saint in a polite way as if he is completely innocent. Deep inside of Gong Ya, he knows the sword saint can actually see the kill count on his head. The sword saint maintains his ground and wants to kill Gong Ya. He shares why he has been hunting alone in the tower because he wants to show people that one could stand on top by himself. He says one can become the greatest here with just a single sword. He says they can survive with just talent and effort. The sword saint then blames them and his words really hurt the black dragon. Viper accuses the sword saint of not supporting them and that led to the death of some hunters. They start to howl abuses on sword saint. He tells them to shut up, if they want to fight they should fight with swords not mouth. Gong Ya then intervenes and starts to settle the dispute. He admonishes them to come together rather than fight. Black Dragon tells him the issue has nothing to do with him but he insists, and he continues to urge them to come together and focus on clearing the 12th floor. Paladin then comes up with her lie detection skill and she claims to put an end to whatever is making the Sword Saint want to kill Gong Ya. She first makes sure the Sword Saint agrees to the lie detection tryout. She assures them she will guarantee the validity of their statements. The Sword Saint puts his faith in Paladin because he knows the Paladin is the only one to have never harmed any human being. Paladin starts the lie detection and tells the Sword Saint to ask questions. The Sword Saint then asks is it true you've murdered over 4,000 people? Then Gong Ya replies yes, but because in the actual sense, Gong Ya has only murdered one person, the Flame Emperor. Paladin gets a wrong answer and the Sword Saint accusation becomes nullified. The Sword Saint starts to freak out that Gong Ya is lying. However, Gong Ya starts to explain the reason why he had to kill the Flame Emperor because he was a bad person. He continues that the Flame Emperor actually tried to kill him. They reason with Gong Ya and they end up finding nothing bad in what he did. Afterwards, Sword Saint also calms down and Gong Ya requests an apology from him. They all perceive the Sword Saint to be in the wrong and they ask him to apologize to Gong Ya. 
The sword saint eventually bows before Gongya and he apologizes. He blames himself for killing anyone he perceives as a murderer without finding out what the person actually is. He says he will stop that act of killing according to his belief. He then promises to do whatever Gongya wishes so Gongya asks him to teach him sword fighting and to accept a dual request whenever he asks. Paladin confirms everything the sword saint has said to be true. Heretic Inquisitor cherishes the moment and she says a true apology is a holy miracle. Boom, Countess interferes and she says does that mean my 20k gold was wasted for nothing? The Sword Saint shakes Gongya vigorously and he promises to even look after him henceforth. The Sword Saint says he knows a highly skilled tailor so that Gongya can have a good outfit. Out of submission to Gongya, the Sword Saint even tells him he will link him up with his granddaughter. He tells them he has a granddaughter outside the tower and if she ever makes it to the tea tower, he will sell her to Gongya's charms. Gongya obviously isn't a womanizer so he turns down the proposal and Sword Saint begins to freak out. After the theme of floor 11 to 20 appears to be role-playing, two rewards appear. Gongya is then left to choose between the goddess and the demon rewards. The goddess reward contains rewards of becoming the empire's chancellor and he gets the abilities and status deserving of the position. The demon reward on the other hand contains rewards similar to the goddess rewards but he gets one additional gift of getting transferred directly to the 99th floor after he kills the top 10 heroes. The hunters see Gongya staring into the air as he ponders on what is before him. The selection begins and the first ranker on the list gets to select first and then others can make their selections. Gongya prefers to select none because he figures out that it will be better for him to select none and see who would select the demon reward and kill them. After the demon reward selector kills them, Gongya knows he gets the chance to return back. This surprises all of them. The selection then goes down the list and each and every one of them selects between the goddess and demon reward. It reaches the Sword Saint's turn to select and after he sees the two rewards, he finally understands why Gong Ya decides to select none of the rewards. However, the Sword Saint ends up selecting the Goddess reward and he picks Ejim Empire's head knight. It reaches the Heretic Inquisitor's turn and she decides to display the rewards for the rest to see. So they are able to see the rewards and they finally understand why Gong Ya doesn't pick any rewards. The Heretic Inquisitor then picks the Goddess rewards as well and she picks the Empire's Great General. Viper chooses the head royal bodyguard and Paladin chooses the Minister of Foreign Affairs. The Black Dragon picks the role of Chancellor and Countess chooses the Minister of Finance. As they select, they advise themselves not to select the Demon Reward because whoever selects it would be at a disadvantage. After they all finish selecting, the result comes and it appears someone actually selects the Demon Reward. Paladin is then called to interrogate everyone with the lie detection. The Black Dragon claims to kill whoever has picked the Demon Reward. Rather than finding the traitor with lie detection, Paladin asks them all to confess first. They didn't suspect Gongya because he didn't even pick any reward in the first place. However, Paladin still asks him and he says no. They all testify to choosing the goddess reward. Then who is the traitor? They all start to panic. Paladin tells them that the traitor might have a skill that hides their lies. Sword Saint then says it might also be Paladin herself. They start to talk about the bond the five guilds have over the years that it's not now that someone will break it. After they establish that a strong bond exists between the top five guilds for good ten years, Heretic Inquisitor and Viper then kill the last three rankers with her special skill. Turns out the traitor isn't among the three they just killed and this makes the Sword Saint really angry and he attacks the Heretic Inquisitor. He cuts her hand and Viper begins to fight him. The Sword Saint is too strong for Viper then he cries out for help. The other guild masters then begin to fight the Sword Saint. Heretic Inquisitor pures a portion on a cutout arm. Paladin sees the chaos and she quickly asks Gongya to stop the Sword Saint. Gongya gains the privilege to settle the dispute after Paladin and trusts him because he didn't even make any selection so he's clear of being the traitor. He ponders on what he has become now that the Vice Captain gives him full authority over the situation. He then begs the Sword Saint to stop the fight. He tells him that he will meet his granddaughter whenever she comes into the tower. The Sword Saint stops to fight them but he says since they've crossed swords, they will die by his hands any time from now. He says it won't be too late to kill them after they've uncovered the traitor. However, the fight stops and they try to focus on finding the traitor. Gongya suggests that if they break the Demon King's core, the reward automatically disappears and they no longer have to worry about the traitor. As Gongya guides them to focus them on their pursuit, the Demon King manifests. The soldiers on floor 12 start to freak out as the rain from their nightmares starts to fall. It's currently at war. Gongya stands and sees the Demon King from afar. Did you think you foolish plebeians could call over people from another world to use as your shields? The Demon Kings refers to the NPCs. The challenge seems to be very difficult for the guilds and they start to freak out. They finally work together and they devise a means to stop the Demon King. They decide to play the role they selected from the Goddess Reward. 
Dong Ya tells each and every one of them to act the role they hold. He tells Viper, the head royal bodyguard, to lead the royal bodyguards. He tells Paladin, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, to find the Emperor since it won't be easy to lead the NPCS while their leader is missing. He tells the heretic Inquisitor, the Great General, to get on top of the castle walls and console the soldiers who are losing their minds. All of them then move out to execute their roles. The Black Dragon appears beside Gong Ya all of a sudden. He asks her how she gets there. She tells him she has teleportation skills. The ghost whispers to Gong Ya that he needs to get Black Dragon to kill him because that skill sounds cool. Black Dragon then asks Gong Ya to teleport with her. After revealing her teleportation skill restriction to Gong Ya, he decides to teleport with her. Eventually they teleport to the top of the wall and they give motivational words to the soldiers as the Black Dragon raises Gong Ya's hands with the legendary sword. Gong Ya reenacts the trauma of his killer and he begins to experience it. The Demon King subdues everywhere and affects the armies with the blood rain that falls. The Demon King triumphs in the trauma Gong Ya experiences. Suddenly the Holy Sword emits light and it stops the rain. The armies rejoice and they hail the goddess for saving them from the blood rain. Black Dragon then yells at them to stand up and hold up their spears. Gong Ya stares at Black Dragon as she motivates the armies. The Black Dragon knows how to give a speech before she is from Ukraine and Ukrainians do give good speeches. However, Gong Ya and Black Dragon begin to talk about how to stop the Demon King. Gong Ya asks her to teleport him to where he can be one-on-one -on -one with the Demon King. Black Dragon calls it suicidal but Gong Ya feels it should be a win. The light from the goddess annoys the Demon King and he retaliates with his own light and he destroys everywhere. He destroys the royal chamber and one hero dies. The Black Dragon figures out it might be Countess. Gong Ya worries about the tower's connection with the outside world because the Countess controls that. Black Dragon then tells him to focus on what is in front of them, which is the Demon King. She teleports Gong Ya right to the front of the Moonsters and the ghost begins to teach him how to fight them. Gong Ya drinks a portion to strengthen himself. The ghost then tells him to become a hero. Gong Ya fights his way through the goblins by timing his every movement. The ghost instructs him to sway his sword continuously. He kills the monster one after the other and he gets carried away by the art of sword fighting. After 10 seconds, he encounters a large monster and he slays it flawlessly. His existence becomes better defined and he levels up to a D-rank hunter. After 30 seconds, the Sword Saint joins him in the fight and he tells him his name. He realizes that during an intense fight, everyone becomes different. The Sword Saint then asks to fight together with him. The Heretic Inquisitor then arrives with the troops and they begin to kill the monsters. Viper also joins Gong Ya and he tells him that he has brought his guildies along with the royal troops. Gong Ya doesn't hear him so Viper fights with him. Paladin also joins them and she gives her own side of the duty. She says she found the Emperor but he has poisoned himself. Gong Ya keeps fighting immensely since he doesn't hear what they are saying. The Sword Saint tells Paladin to leave Gong Ya when she tries to call him. The hunters then get to the Demon Lord and they come together. Black Dragon is going to teleport them close to the Demon King where they will attack. Black Dragon reaches out to Gong Ya who is busy fighting to come so that they can teleport together. Gong Ya knows he only wants to be killed by the Demon King so that when he comes back, he gains more strength. He joins with the rest and they teleport and land in front of the Demon King. He lets go of his hand and he tries to strike the Demon King. The Demon King asks have you come to kill me? And Gong Ya replies to him I came here to die to you fuck. He dies as he shows the Demon King his middle finger. He starts to copy the Demon King's skills. Gong Ya wonders why the tower gives an opportunity of skill copy to someone as worthless as him. The ghost checks the skills and he volunteers to read it out to Gong Ya. Gong Ya then tells him to read it. Gong Ya knows the tower is probably disappointed in the attitude demonstrated by the hunters. The ghost shares the first skill resentment pours like rain with him. He shares the next skill echoes of a crying heart. He also shares the next skill ghoul summoning with him. As he shares all the skills, Gong Ya thinks about the tower and the events. Gong Ya selects a skill eventually and he asks the ghost about the daily routine of the sword saint. The ghost agrees to let Gong Ya know the sword saint dinner schedule when he says he needs it for something. Gong Ya completes the skill selection and the copy begins. He faces the trauma penalty afterwards. Are you leaving already? Black Dragon asks Gong Ya. Gong Ya has gone back in time to floor 10. Floor 11 will be opening soon and Gong Ya looks tense. Black Dragon asks him what is wrong with him. What else will Gong Ya say? He lies yet again. He says he got a bit emotional thinking about how amazing people are here with him. He then tells the guildmasters that the information he was given for clearing floor 10 allows him to know the situation on floor 11 and the quest. However, he asks for their favor in exchange for the information he has. They agree to give him the favor later whenever he asks for it. He then begins to explain the situation of Floor 11 to them. After he finishes, he asks Paladin to go on a walk with him and she agrees. They walk towards the slum and the ghost hints to Gong Ya that the Sword Saint is following them but he shouldn't look back. 
they finally get to the pharmacist's shop and they enter. The pharmacist is happy to see Gong Ya and she asks who Paladin is. Gong Ya tells her about Paladin and she bows down immediately and she starts to beg. She claims not to sell drugs. However, Gong Ya tells the pharmacist that Paladin is not here to inspect her but he rather brings her as a customer. This makes the pharmacist really happy and right there, Sword Saint enters the shop and he requests for private chat with Gong Ya. Continuing the story Sword Saint enters the pharmacist's shop and he requests a private moment with Gong Ya. Paladin asks the Sword Saint what business he has there and he insists on having a private moment with Gong Ya. Sword Saint then orders Paladin to step out and she also refuses. Gong Ya has joined the top 5 guilds so that makes Paladin interested in whatever business the Sword Saint has with him. Paladin sides with Gong Ya and she claims to stop the Sword Saint even if it costs her life. When Paladin says these words, the Sword Saint calms down. Gong Ya knew from his previous life that the Sword Saint's weakness is innocent people. Paladin has zero kill count which makes her totally innocent. Even though the Sword Saint is brutal in his judgments, the last thing he would do is lay his hands on innocent people. Gong Ya knew this and that's why he left with only the Paladin. Speaking of innocent people, the pharmacist interferes and she also tries to protect her dear life-saving customer. In the end, the pharmacist orders the Sword Saint to leave her shop. As the Sword Saint leaves, Gong Ya voices out and asks the Sword Saint to meet him at the field north of the city the following day at noon if he wants to find out the kind of person he is. After the Sword Saint left, they talked about him as the killer demon and how his daughter and son-in-law were killed by a heinous murderer. The next day, Gong Ya meets the Sword Saint at the appointed location. The Sword Saint starts to talk about Gong Ya's confidence of coming there alone. He then tells the Sword Saint that he has a skill of prophecy. He exposes the skill of eyes of a detective that the Sword Saint has and this shocks him. The Sword Saint asks Gong Ya to guess the number of fingers he's holding up behind his back. Gong Ya goes speechless and the Sword Saint kills him. He returns back to the same scene after he comes back to life. Now that he already knows what the Sword Saint will ask him, he says it before the Sword Saint asks. As if that was enough, the Sword Saint kills him again. After several dying and coming back, Gong Ya finally convinces the Sword Saint and he agrees to give him a 5 days head start. Gong Ya stands in the battlefield just like he stood in the last cycle. The Black Dragon gives order to the remaining guild leaders to flank around and conquer the battlefield. The hunters follow the Black Dragon's orders and they begin to fight the monsters. The commander sees this and he also motivates the Empire soldiers to fight alongside the heroes from another world. Gong Ya keeps standing like he did in the previous cycle while he talks to the ghost. He sees the Sword Saint staring at him and he asks if the Sword Saint is planning on watching him 24-7. The Sword Saint slays monsters as he talks to Gong Ya because the rewards are going to be given out according to their contributions in the battle. Gong Ya goes to the Black Dragon to tell her that he possesses the reward for clearing floor 10. He tells her that he has the map that shows everything on the battlefield including the locations of the Demon King. On hearing this, the Black Dragon decides to teleport Gong Ya to the Demon King. She teleports him there and Gong Ya slays the Demon King. The Black Dragon Hunters chased down the remaining monsters and they killed them all. Following the victory on the battlefield, the Black Dragon starts to praise Gong Ya and she eventually shakes him. Gong Ya already knew how everything would turn out, so he thought to himself of protecting the people. When the rankings appear, Gong Ya discovers that the rankings have changed drastically from the last cycle. The Black Dragon predicts that they will clear floor 20 quickly with a minimal loss but she is wrong. If Gong Ya doesn't help them, they will end up with a great loss on floor 12. Gong Ya knows the future and he is always one step ahead. When they get to the 12th floor, the heretic Inquisitor starts to praise him. He stops her from praising him then he reminds them of the favor he previously asked from them. He asks them to remain in the house for 5 good days. If they can do it, he promises to clear up floor 20 in 5 days. Gong Ya reflects on what the hologram that appeared when floor 11 opened as he asks for their favor. A whole 5 days, the black dragon begins to oppose Gong Ya. Though they cleared floor 11 under an hour with the help of Gong Ya, the black dragon doesn't think he can single-handedly defeat the demon king so she addresses him by being too overconfident. Gong Ya then claims to have shared with them the rewards of clearing floor 10. The things he did for them on floor 11, they shouldn't find it difficult to do this favor for him. He then asks them again to kindly do him the favor. However, the heretic inquisitor starts to analyze what Gong Ya has done for them so far and she concludes that she approves of it. She reminds them of their promise to Gong Ya that they will grant the favor whenever he asks them and after all, the favor is not exactly impossible. They finally submit to Gong Ya's request except for Sword Saint who makes it clear that he has never agreed to such a promise. Matter of fact, the only promise he made was to watch over Gong Ya for the next 5 days. Well, Gong Ya doesn't have any problem with the Sword Saint monitoring him. He thanks them for listening to his favor and he leaves the house. On getting outside, the ghost sees that the NPCs are frozen and Gong Ya tells him it's because the quest hasn't started yet. 
The quest won't start unless the hunters select their profession. That was what happened on the battlefield, they got the quest because they have selected their positions. Gong Ya also explains that if he kills the boss before the quest starts, it means no one should be able to pick the Demon King's reward. And just right there, the Demon King manifests. The decision Gong Ya made ensures that no hunter dies and they also can't end up with a traitor. He challenges the Demon King as he tries to kill him in the frozen world. The Demon King kills Gong Ya and he returns back. He goes back to the Demon King and he dies again. He repeats that severally but each time he dies, he marks his palm. He wonders how many soldiers would have died on Floor 11 Battlefield. For every soldier that dies, at least 2 years of unused life disappears. When 10 die, 200 years disappear. When 100 die, 2000 years. In order to rescue all that time, Gongya decided not to choose any position and to get himself locked into eternity. He kept on dying and returning to the Demon King until he had so many markings on his hand. The Black Dragon's count of the dead soldiers on the battlefield reduces every time Gong Ya gets a new mark on his hand. Another wave of death for Gong Ya, he smiles this time around and this bothers the Demon King and he asks him why. Gong Ya tells the Demon King that he can't understand, in fact no one will. Finally, the Black Dragon tells Gong Ya that not a single person died and she hugs him. As Gong Ya is busy with the Demon King, the Black Dragon arrives from the chambers. She felt too antsy so she came out. The Black Dragon then joins him in fighting the Demon King. The Demon King got tired of fighting with a sword so he summoned the ghouls. The Sword Saint gets ready to start slaying the monster though he claims to have wanted to spectate Gong Ya longer. The Black Dragon then asks them to grab her hand so they can teleport but Gong Ya says no. Instead of teleporting, he summons ghouls with ghoul summoning skill. The Demon King sees this and all he can say is what? The creation of the Demon King started with transformation from many species. Every time it obtained a new body, it gained a new joy. Once it kills its prey, it slowly obtains the memories of its prey. It killed a young girl in the woods and it transformed into that girl. The girl was frail and her father came looking for her. Her name was Esther and that was the first ever name the Demon King obtained. Gong Ya activates the ghoul summoning skill and thousands of skeletons with a knife in their hands appear. Gong Ya actually picked the ghoul summoning skill instead of the skill to strengthen his aura. He asks the ghost about how many people he thinks he has killed. The ghost answers that he has only killed two, the flame emperor and himself. But the ghost is wrong. Gong Ya explains that he has murdered himself over 4000 times and the ghoul summoning skill is a skill that brings forth the actual number of deaths that have been caused as soldiers. Thousands of skeletons that don't fear death emerge. Even the black dragon is amazed at that kind of skill. The demon king on the other hand starts to freak out. He wonders how Gong Ya has been able to use the same skill he uses. Gong Ya orders the sword saint to fight alongside three skeletons and the black dragon to fight alongside himself to defeat the demon king. Gong Ya raises up his holy sword and he commands the thousand skeletal soldiers to fight and perish anything in their paths. The hero of the day, fearless Gong Ya then gets an alias from the tower which is the king of death. How cool is that? The demon king, Esther, didn't age a bit, instead it became more beautiful and a scent enveloped its body, enchanting the people around it. Esther could cure any illness and a large number of people went to her for help. They took all their illnesses to her. She collected a baby from her mother and she told her to return back when the dawn breaks. She cared for the sick baby and she swallowed it. After she swallowed the baby whole, the baby's memory flowed into Esther. Esther restored the baby back to life as a healthy baby and she returned her baby back to her mother. Esther then became the savior of the Outlands. Esther's influence made the authority of the Empire fall to the ground so the Empire decided to fight back. They referred to Esther as a witch and they showed no mercy to the followers of the witch. They burned everywhere to the ground and when Esther saw this, she became a rogue. Back to the present day, Gong Ya keeps fighting the Demon King and he dies eventually after failing to figure out what side the Demon King will strike from. After he dies, he realizes that he has 6 days 23 minutes and 27 seconds left till he can reuse the ghoul summoning skill. He returns back and he dies again. Each time he dies, the countdown to the ghoul summoning skill usage drops by a day. He dies again, that's minus one day. Until the countdown finally reduces to 23 hours 41 minutes and 13 seconds left. He then reuses the skill and thousands of skeletons emerge again. Afterwards, the ghost starts to talk to him about the crazy things he does. By doing this, the ghost distracts him and he loses focus thereby resulting in another death. He dies and he promises to beat the hell out of the ghost for distracting him. The ghost makes a gesture of him instead. When Gong Ya returns, he starts to direct the black dragon as she fights the demon king. After acting according to what Gong Ya says, the Black Dragon finally gets a chance to hit the Demon King and she takes it. She hits the Demon King real bad that it weakens it. She hits the Demon King again when it exposes an opening in its torso. By doing so, Gong Ya is able to see a skin in the Demon King. 
Now that the Demon King is badly injured, it decides to retreat to floor 13. Following the retreat, the tower acknowledges Gongya's choice and a hidden quest is being created. The floor 12 quest has been amended in Zoom, floor 13 to 19 have also been amended. Gongya then accepts the quest the hero of the time frozen world. The system searches for the Demon King on floor 12 and it is nowhere to be found. The system then confirms the retreat of the Demon King. Suddenly, blue sparkings start to flow around and the Black Dragon asks what is happening. None of them happens to know what is going on. Then Gongyo sees changes at the Empire entrance and he decides to teleport with the Black Dragon to the top of the entrance to check out what is actually going on. When they reach the top, they see total changes in the Empire. The Empire has changed from a dark cloud, dull and dusty city to a bright and beautiful city. The timeline has been altered. Originally, the Ejim Empire should have been invaded by the Demon King. They could have either lost or won. But the invasion was an event set in time. However, in this world, the invasion by the Demon King became an event that never happened. Gong Ya and the Black Dragon watch as the citizens interact with one another and then boom, the commander shouts at him. The commander wants to know who Gong Ya is, which makes him step foot in their empire gatehouse. Gong Ya reminisces on how nice and welcoming the commander was back then on the battlefield and now, he is acting harsh and tough. Unexpectedly, Gong Ya burst into laughter and he shouts I did it. I protected the empire. Why won't he do that? He defeated the Demon King after hundreds of days. His voice cover covers the whole empire because he is talking from the top of the entrance gatehouse. He speaks about the kind of low life he was living. Now that he has saved an entire empire, he has nothing to be ashamed of. Still in that awkward moment, the raid contribution displays and Gongya comes first. The Black Dragon and the Sword Saint come second and third respectively. Furthermore, Gongya tells the commander to take good care of the empire. They eventually teleport to floor 13 after the Black Dragon asks Gongya to say the word. On getting to the floor 13, they see the Demon King and it begins to scream and alarm it that they've taken everything away from it. The ghost figures out that the Demon King got hurt from the previous impact. That is why it screams awfully. Following the defeat of Floor 12, the Demon King retreated and that led to decrease in the Demon King's rank. The system then displays that all the rewards will be tabulated upon clearing Floor 19 but Gong Ya gets basic rewards. He gets the world map which contains all the maps from Floor 11 to Floor 20. After checking the map details, Gong Ya figures out why the Demon King is actually weak. It is because when they defeated him, not only the Demon King's history of invasion on the Empire disappeared but its entire invasion on the continents disappeared. That means they returned to a time before the Demon King properly invaded the continent. Gong Ya also figured out that the existence part that the hunters hear whenever they level up means the contributions they've actually had. Now that the Demon King's history of invasion has disappeared, it results in no existence for it on the continent. This makes the Demon King furious and he releases ghouls upon them. Gong Ya bets with the ghost on how many deaths he will die before clearing floor 19 and they agree on it most 99. As he fights, he dies. Gong Ya tells the sword saint that there is a coffin that if he checks, he will see a hammer that is effective against undead. The Sword Saint grabs it eventually and he uses it to take care of most of the zombies. Gong Ya keeps dying as the event goes on. Now it remains the one-eyed zombie giant in front of them. Its eyes attract their attack but it's a trap. Gong Ya warns the Black Dragon not to aim for the eyes since she has already done that and they all died. She then agrees not to hit the giant eyes and they eventually defeat the giant. With this, the Demon King retreats to Floor 14. The Demon King's retreat means they've cleared Floor 13 and they transfer to Floor 14. The Demon King keeps on retreating until Floor 19 where its existence becomes faint. Gong Ya sees the eye of the Demon King and he tries to fight it. He calls out the Demon King's name, Esther, and he dares it to fight with all it has. Gong Ya dies by the Demon King's hand and he gets penalized by the skill. He has to experience the trauma of his killer. Gong Ya begins to experience the trauma. He sees how the soldiers burnt down and killed the people Esther has healed. They showed no mercy. Esther wasn't around when they were destroying everything. When she came back, she saw everyone dead and she swallowed their ashes. She then manifested into the demon lord after several biblical condemnations of the entire human race as being evil. The human evil is what created the demon king and the trauma ended. Back to reality, Gong Ya fights the demon king until it becomes significantly smaller. Gong Ya then tells the demon king to run away to floor 20 because that's the final stop for the demon king. The Black Dragon says she will allow Gong Ya to have the final hit when the Demon King retreats to Floor 20. After the Demon King's retreat has been confirmed, Gong Ya then asks the Sword Saint and the Black Dragon to allow him to transfer to Floor 20 alone. Without hesitation, the Black Dragon accepts. However, the Sword Saint also agrees but he reminds Gong Ya that they have a lot to talk about once he has cleared Floor 20. On getting to Floor 20 alone, Gong Ya gets the reward to modify any skill he possesses with the exception of an X-Rank skill. Golden Flame flows around Gong Ya as he points sword at the Demon King for the final battle. 
the Demon King continues to condemn Gong Ya's invasion and all. Out of frustration, the Demon King attacks Gong Ya but is too weak to defeat him. On floor 12, the Demon King was the one invading and Gong Ya was the defending but now, the Demon King is the one defending now. Gong Ya kept on striking the Demon King and it grew weaker. Then the image of Esther manifests eventually and Gong Ya stops striking. He tries to move closer to Esther and she asks him to stop. Gong Ya moves close to her and he begins to blame and condemn her for her deeds. The Demon King tries to make Gong Ya know that he doesn't understand who she truly is but Gong Ya keeps blaming her. The Demon King finally admits all what she has done but she claims she didn't know what the pains of Esther were before harming her. All the soldiers she killed are part of the innocent lives lost due to the Demon King's effect. However, Gong Ya decides to pass karma judgment on the Demon King. He tells the tower that he wishes to use his clear reward. He asks the tower to adjust his ghoul summoning ability such that whoever he summons can still retain their memories. The tower grants his wish and he decides to kill the demon king now. The demon king fights back after Gong Ya tries to strike it for good this time. She fights him whilst she is terribly weak and unskilled. Gong Ya breaks the demonic sword she is using to fight back. So these are the final moments of the demon king. She lies weak and defeated on the floor. Gong Ya observes her last moment and he finally raises up his sword to kill her. Just on the verge of killing her, the ghost tells him to wait. The ghost doesn't think the demon king can be ghoul reincarnated after Gong Ya kills her. The ghost gives his opinion on the whole ghoul reincarnation theory. He thinks ghoul reincarnation might not work out with NPCS. Gong Ya reasons along with his observation and he decides to ask the tower again. The tower then requests a vote from the six pillars of all lives and this gets Gong Ya wonder what in the world that is. Gong Ya suddenly finds himself in the middle of nowhere and the system begins to confirm participants. He cannot see anything but he can feel the overwhelming presence. All of a sudden, the six pillars of all life appear before him. His question is being asked again and all he hears is an unknown language response. The six pillars of all lives are to vote regarding the subject of discussion. Five of them voted and the result was two positives, two negatives and one abstained. One more vote remaining. Gong Ya then figures out that the six pillars of all lives are probably concerned that Gong Ya will indiscriminately kill NPCs and summon them afterwards. He then lets them know he is not that kind of person. He persuades them in the last one of the six votes in his favor. The King of Death's temporary apostle is revoked and he returns back to life. While he was with the six pillars of all lives, he was in a daze in real life. He tells the ghost that was taken to a neverland, the six pillars of all voted and all. But the ghost doesn't seem to understand any of what he said. He then figures out the ghost doesn't know anything of the beings despite clearing the 100th floor in another world. The ghost has actually cleared the 100th floor in another world that is why he has so much experience about virtually everything. Gong Ya then kills the demon king and he resurrects her. The ghost watches as everything happens. Gong Ya then gives her a new name. He calls her Preta. The ghost becomes curious after Preta bows her head to Gong Ya so he asks him why. The ghost is curious because he thinks Esther will hate and resent him after all he has done to her. Gong Ya replies to him that he will find out the reason why soon enough. The system confirms the presence of the demon king and it could not be found. Gong Ya finally cleared floor 20. Preta is however scared of what the village will do to her again. Preta knees as she begs her master, Gong Ya when General Sarbast Ejim and his men arrive. Gong Ya blocks their path and the general is forced to ask him who he is. The timeline has been altered and all these people no longer know the hunters. The emperor had heard about Esther and her whereabouts so he sent General Sarbast Ejim to arrest the witch. Gong Ya stands confidently before the general and they exchange words. Gong Ya reminds the general about who he is just to get him humble but it doesn't work out. Gong Ya finally tries to prove himself and he raises his sword up. Gong Ya refers to himself as the emissary sent by the mighty founder Li Fan to Ejim and all the soldiers express a state of shock. The general gets down from his horse and he kneels before Gong Ya. The other generals do the same as well. The ghost admires Gong Ya's confidence and he also advises him to put the confidence to use in fighting as well. Back to the main reason why the soldiers are there. They came to subjugate the witch. In order to protect Preta, Gong Ya decides to tell the soldiers that he has already subjugated the witch. Gong Ya tells Preta to move forward and he starts to give her different exercise programs to weaken her. After she was done doing all what he instructed her, he tells the general that Preta has already been subjugated by him because she follows his commands. The general believes him since he is the emissary of the Great Eastern Founder but another soldier behind the general speaks out. The fact that Gong Ya claims to be the emissary of the Great Eastern Founder doesn't sit well with him. Even though the sword in Gong Ya's hand signifies the goddess favor on the empire, this particular soldier still doubts him. In the midst of all that, a dragon head being from the merpeople comes forth and decides to settle the matter. She has the soul orb granted to him by the emperor of the merpeople. 
If a drop of blood is placed on the orb, it will detect whether the person is good or evil. Gong Yan and Preda are then called to the test. When the blood of one with a good soul touches the orb, it will emanate a white light, and with the blood of one with an evil soul, the orb will turn pitch black. The dragon head gets hold of Preta and she uses his claws to cut her hand. She spills her blood on the orb and it turns black on the spot. After the orb turned black, she confirmed that Preta is the demon king. They then try to do the same with Gong Ya. The orb emits a very bright light after his blood drops on the orb. The dragon head woman confirms the purity of Gong Ya. Even after the whole bright light, the soldier still doesn't get convinced and he asks why Gong Ya has to stop them in the first place. The paladin of the temple says Gong Ya should even assist them in their mission if he is truly the emissary of the founder. Gong Ya then replies to him. He forms tactics in his head and he begins to spill. He tells them he is called all evil and divine punishment has already been executed. He brings forth the skeletons and he calls them the evil doers that he called one by one. He says that subjugating all the evils of the world is his mission and imprisoning the fiends in hell is his job. They submit to Gong Ya after everything he said. The paladin of the temple then asks if the monsters are truly locked away. He further asks Gong Ya what he intends to do with his skeleton. Gong Ya then tells one of the skeletons to recover its memories. Boom. The skeleton turns to the flame emperor and he immediately gets hold of Gong Ya. The people see what is happening and Gong Ya lets them know the Flame Emperor was nothing but evil. Gong Ya then snaps his fingers and the Flame Emperor goes straight into a punishment state. He hangs by one leg and raises the other. Gong Ya can control whoever he has called and he does all these to prove to them that he is being truthful. The paladin asks for his name and he tells them. After gaining their trust and respect, that results into clearing the hidden quest, Hero of the Frozen World. Gong Ya single-handedly clears floor 20 and the result is to be given in 24 hours after entering floor 21. Gong Ya begins to tell the ghost that he cleared floor 20 without any casualties, he even saved Preta. The system displays a public announcement that floor 20 has been cleared. The system emphasizes it. Gong Ya picks his phone to check the internet and see what's going on. Ghost figures out that Gong Ya is trying to check the affairs of online commenters and what they will be saying after floor 20 has been cleared. He accuses Gong Ya of deciding not to pay attention to the responses of others. Gong Ya denies it and then right there, the black dragon witch comes about. She hugs Gong Ya from the back and she starts to praise him. She starts to talk about how people have been going crazy because of Gong Ya. It's no child's job, a single hunter doing all that alone by himself. It's truly a matter of great wonder and appraisal. The black dragon witch shows Gong Ya the screenshots of what people are saying. Gong Ya then wonders how she got all the screenshots because floor 20 doesn't have a network. Eventually, he discovers that the witch has actually teleported back to floor 1 to peep what people were saying. Gong Ya thinks of Black Dragon as a very friendly person as she shows him the overall tower ranking where he ranks 3rd. The Black Dragon witch however, praises his ability to reach that level in a short period of time. Afterwards, she advises him to pay a little more attention to his attitude because he is now the center of focus. She further advises him not to pull up the behavior of the Sword Saint who is a lone bird that destroys anything in his paths. The presence of soldiers on floor 20 baffles the witch so she asks Gong Ya. After explaining to her how they came about, he also confesses the lie he told the people that he is the emissary of whatever of the Empire's founder. They start to talk about trading with this continent since trading with the outside world has not been so easy. Gong Ya offers to give them the title of Apostle of the Goddess so that they get the chance to trade easily with the continent in exchange for Floor 20 land. Following the negotiation, they teleport back to Floor 1 and the media rush them with camera flashes and unending questions. Gong Ya becomes nervous and the witch tries to mentor him. The media address Gong Ya as the king of death and they throw so many questions at him. Among the questions is what relationship does he has the black dragon? Now that's a tricky question. The black dragon and the sword saint then start to lecture him concerning the media and how to behave when you are with them. With the media around, they tell him he must not say words anyhow as it will represent him immediately. They walk through the ever-disturbing reporters without saying a single word. Now that Gong Ya is so famous, the Black Witch tells him he will have limited access to the internet and all. Gong Ya has to be emotionless and the Black Dragon explains how she is able to wipe out emotions from her face. They walk through the media and they finally get to the house where the other guild members are. They welcome them in and they start to praise Gong Ya, the man of the hour. Gong Ya also gives them nice gestures. The heretic inquisitor then explains how the NPCS thought they were enemies that intruded inside the palace. So the NPCS came and they let the NPCS arrest them. However, they escaped from the prison and came back to the house. As the heretic inquisitor narrates the whole story, Gong Ya thinks that the incident must have happened when he defeated the demon king, because the timeline was altered. 
They sit round the table as they discuss. However, the Black Dragon decides to talk about the historical background of each and every one of them. She then advances to their characters because she wants to make Gongya the hero that represents the tower. They themselves admit that their characters aren't fit for the position. They start to suggest a public figure display for him. They also decide to call a designer and a photographer. They make Gongya rocks a suit and a photographer takes his shot. But Gongya doesn't seem to like all the celebrity photos so he stops them. Later on, Gongya and the Sword Saint run away just to escape the situation of the celebrity branding palaver. Gongya and the Sword Saint finally get over the whole stress. Then a NPCS soldier gets to them and speaks to the Sword Saint. But she realizes Gongya is there and she asks him to sign an autograph for her. He signs it and she leaves. After the NPCS soldier leaves, Gongya engages the Sword Saint in conversation. He convinces him that he is not a bad guy as the Sword Saint has painted him. In the end, the Sword Saint reasons along with him and he finally decides to let him go free. Gongya acknowledges that he no longer has to worry about Sword Saint killing him after five days. The Goddess of Protection then calls out to Gongya. He finds out that the holy sword he has been holding is the Goddess of Protection. The news about the identity of the man who conquered Floor 20 is being broadcasted and after some time into the broadcast, Gongya switches off the television. He feels embarrassed about what he is seeing. Suddenly, the Holy Sword speaks to him and it also joins everyone in praising Gong Ya. Gong Ya begins to think that the Holy might also stand him. Gong Ya then starts to talk about constellations. He has never seen an item that's a constellation. The Goddess of Protection has to reply to the confused Gong Ya. The Goddess of Protection says it's better to think of constellations as something that can represent each world. The Goddess of Protection explains that she was originally a holy spirit that was worshipped as a god. However, the founder of the empire, Li Fanta Ejim, sealed her by splitting her up into five swords. She is the first of these holy swords the idol. The Goddess of Protection then brags that by gathering up all the five swords, she can regain all the power of her golden days. Out of curiosity, Gongya decides to ask the Goddess of Protection about the whereabouts of the other sister swords and she goes mute. Gongya begins to criticize the Goddess of Protection as she speaks about her abilities, then the Black Dragon Witch knocks. She asks if there's any problem because she heard the noise. However, she reminds Gongya of the press conference that is starting in 5 minutes. After she leaves, Gongya continues to criticize the Goddess of Protection and he eventually coins a name for her. He calls her Shiny. After 5 minutes the press conference starts. Gongya and the witch sit before the reporters. The witch speaks through the mic and she says everything about their tower achievements. But a reporter steps forward and asks Gongya about the bargain he had with the top guilds concerning acquiring Floor 20 and the guild getting high recognition on Floor 20. The Black Dragon tells him to remain silent but Gongya decides to reply to him. He has his ways. Gongya takes the mic and he greets them all. He introduces himself and he leaves an expression on his face that repels the reporters from asking irrelevant questions. He then blames himself for his inadequacies. Gongya recalls the days of the Flame Emperor and he decides to address the press in the opposite manner as that of the Flame Emperor. He establishes a principle if you invert the worst, it becomes the best. He speaks to the media in the best manner which he derives by saying exactly opposite things to what the Flame Emperor said. After giving his speech, Gongya tries to end the question and answer but the reporters keep asking more questions. The Black Dragon Witch collects the mic from Gongya and she continues to address the press. But all of a sudden, a reporter comes up with a serious question. He asks about the relationship between Gongya and the Black Dragon. Everybody first pauses, now that's a serious question. The Black Dragon then answers him by saying that they are comrades that are more than friends. Her response rather makes the reporters more curious and they won't stop asking further questions. The Black Dragon and Gongya leave the conference eventually. Gongya is also curious about her response, so he asks her. She tells him she said that just to bring the attention towards herself. The countdown to the opening of Floor 21 reaches 1 and it opens. The hologram appears again with a new announcement. Those that have made it to the Floor 20 from Floor 11 have actually gained the privilege of transferring to the top of the tower automatically. They all start to transfer without even saying the word. On Floor 21, a small boy in white robes welcomes them to the Great Library of All Knowledge. The floating small boy is the Constellation Hold Up Head Librarian and she welcomes them again to the Great Library of All Knowledge. The hunters begin to ask themselves of their new location. The Black Dragon then asks the librarian who he is. The librarian manages a very huge library which he refers to as a slightly large library. The librarian identifies Gongya and he calls the hunters heroes of epics. The books gathered in the great library of all knowledge are no ordinary books. They are books related to the world where the tower exists. The library gives the reason why only a few of the hunters were able to teleport to floor 21. 
the reason being that they are the only hunters with aliases. The witch gets worried about such selection but the librarian quickly reassures them that since just three of them cleared floor 20, they won't find it difficult to clear the quest he has prepared for them with even the help of 300 other hunters. In order to explain the quest for the hunters, the librarian decided to use his own style. He opens a book and they somehow, mysteriously enter into the book and he begins to explain to them like that. The librarian also tells them that he refers to his books as Apocalypse. He explains the reason for cancellation to them. Cancellation is seen as the end of the world, it happens to some world with water while another with fire. The moment they return back after he is done, they vomit. The librarian then gives them the main quest of Floor 12. They have to pick eight volumes among the cancelled apocalypse which literally means eight worlds. They now have to pick eight worlds and save them. That is the quest. Following the unusual event of entering into a strange world in a book, the hunters are forced to vomit. The library bookmarks come to clean their vomits. Furthermore, the librarian instructs them about the dos and don'ts of the library and then suddenly, one of the hunters interrupts the librarian. The hunter claims the librarian might as well be the boss demon of the floor and he proposes that they should kill the librarian. What a reckless thought. As if that's enough, he even ridicules Gong Ya for having cleared floor 20 single-handedly. The rudeness of these hunters annoys the black dragon and she wants to fight. But Gong Ya holds her back, calms her down and lets her know that they are currently being watched. The events going on in the library are being broadcasted live. Gong Ya knew this because prior to his regression, he spectated the raid up to floor 30 from the town square. She then understands why she mustn't overreact so she calms down. However, Gong Ya gets the normal reward of the floor. The reward means he is able to observe the psyche of characters. He immediately tests it on the black dragon by looking at her. He sees her specs but she catches him while staring. He quickly tells her it's nothing. He tests it on Ghost as well and Ghost begins to freak out. Some hunters agree with the insane hunter to bring down the librarian. Speaking of defeating a demon king, the sword saint sees them as no match against who has the ability to transmit them into a strange world by opening just a book. So he advises them to back off. The librarian then opens a book which contains the apocalypse where humanity fell and only a single magician survived. The hunters that want to fight the librarian get pulled into the book. The librarian closes back the book and begins to give his opinion on the apocalypse and the magician. Gong Ya then advises the rest of the hunters that as they can see, they cannot pick a fight with the constellation. He suggests they just take whatever quests he gives them. After all, they get to pick a book which they can clear the world and get whatever benefits they're in. Gong Ya mans up and opens a book and nothing seems to occur. The librarian then tells them the forbidden books that are dangerous have been hidden. The stages on the 22nd series of floors are Worlds of Apocalypse. Gong Ya reads out the summary of the book Tales of Sormuan Academy to the hunters. The lovers of the story died after a demon appeared. Such a bad ending. Gong Ya then advises them to grab a book that is actually possible to clear and also beneficial. There are hundreds of volumes of Apocalypse available, Gong Ya definitely can't read all of them. He then gathers the hunters and he divides them into groups. Each group is to read a particular genre of book. He tasks them to decide if a book is a hit or a flop. The heretic inquisitor doesn't seem to understand the word flop so she asks Gong Ya. Gong Ya explains that flop means the world isn't unfit to be cleared. After they gather in groups to start the task, the black dragon chooses the misery genre. Unlike the romance character seen earlier by Gong Ya using his psyche of character skill, the black dragon's sudden change of character shocks him. He asks her why she is choosing that group and she begins to feel herself. Heretic Inquisitor on the other hand, picks exactly what her character says. She picks the children's story and she happens to be the only one in that group. Gong Ya oversees the hunters as they read and he also goes close to Viper to see what he has been reading. After the Black Dragon reads to some extent, she figures out the main purpose of the apocalypses. The apocalypses all ended unhappily. She understands that reading the books will only get them to feel like the constellation. She then whispers it to Gong Ya and the librarian also realizes that they have finally had the idea of his pain. Then suddenly, the alchemist walks up to Gong Ya. She moves close to Gong Ya and she tells him about her new alias. Just as she had promised Gong Ya, she refreshes her promise to help Gong Ya if she needs anything. After a while of reading, most of the groups finish their books. Gong Ya then asks them to give him whatever suggestions they have. The Sword Saint then gives his group suggestion of clearing a world from the book that has martial art benefits. Suddenly, Shiny tells Gong Ya it has detected the presence of her sister's sword inside the book that the Sword Saint is holding. Gong Ya decides to die and restart before going to the martial realm. Reason being that, he doesn't know anything about Lifanta Ejim who was the first emperor of the empire, and all the one that turned the goddess of protection into shiny. Gong Ya doesn't want to encounter a guy whom he knows nothing about. He figures that if he stabs himself with the sword, though it might either count as suicidal or murder, he will be able to learn a couple of things about Lifanta Ejim. 
He then stabs himself with the sword and he dies. Back to the usual realm, Gongya is unable to copy any skills from the Goddess of Protection because the skills are sealed. Rather than copying the skills, he gets penalized by the skill instead. He has to experience the trauma of the Goddess of Protection. As usual, Gongya and the Ghost experience every trauma together so they spectate the conversation between the Goddess of Protection and Li Fanta Ejim. The Goddess of Protection stood before Li Fanta Ejim and she spoke about how mighty he has now become, though the Goddess of Protection was the one who actually helped Li Fanta Ejim become great. In the end, Li Fanta Ejim betrayed the Goddess of Protection and he sealed her. When Gongya returns to life, he asks Shiny why her old master did that to her. Well, she doesn't seem to understand either. Back to Sword Saint who suggests the Martial Realm. The librarian makes it clear that only two to four people can be the characters of the apocalypse. Without any hesitation, Gongya volunteers himself. The Sword Saint also volunteers himself. Two more people are needed at maximum to fill up the slots so the Sword Saint recommends the Medicine King since what ended the martial realm is a pandemic. Gongya also recommends the alchemist, Miss Apothecary, to fill up the slots. Now they have four volunteers to go to the dangerous world. Miss Apothecary hides behind Gongya after seeing the Sword Saint because she is terrified by him. The Sword Saint then tells her not to be afraid as he has settled his qualms with the King of Death. The Sword Saint also warns Gongya not to bring anyone that might die in the dangerous world. Death in the apocalypse means death in real life. The King of Death then reassures the Sword Saint that Miss Apothecary is the greatest medicine maker he knows. After hearing this statement from Gongya, the Medicine King becomes jealous and he begins to abuse the younger generation. He continues to criticize Gongya, and even when the Sword Saint tries to caution him, he makes him shut up. Miss Apothecary couldn't just stand by and watch, so she defends Gongya. Paladin also vouches that Miss Apothecary is a professional that she even supplies portions for the Vigilante Corps. As everything happens, Gongya maintains absolute calmness because he knows everything is being broadcasted live at Babylon Square. However, in order to settle the matter, Gongya decides to set up a duo match between Miss Apocalyptic and the Medicine King. Whoever creates the best medicine after Gongya provides them with medicinal ingredients gets to win. At first, Miss Apothecary feels intimidated by the Medicine King but then Gongya motivates her. Meanwhile the audience has already created a betting forum where they can quickly bet on who will win. The duo starts and the Medicine King becomes the first to create his portion. He flaunts his creation, Epic Health Portion, which shines out a bright light. Without wasting time, the audience immediately bids for the Medicine King's portion. As they try to buy it, Miss Apothecary finishes her own portion and the light that emanates from her portion is so bright that it covers everywhere. The hunters switch their portion dealer right away and they begin to bid for Miss Apothecary's portion. Instead of paying attention to the audience, Miss Apothecary rather focuses on Medicine King and she begins to oppress him. Payback has never been better. She refers to the Medicine King as an old man and she looks down on his portion. The Medicine King also wants to stand tall so he claims Miss Apothecary's victory is just a mere luck. In order to prove him wrong, Miss Apothecary invites him to another round. He goes on another round with her and she still beats him. They compete up to four rounds and Miss Apothecary keeps on winning. The Sword Saint starts to feel ashamed for the Medicine King. However, the Sword Saint apologizes to Miss Apothecary and he accepts that she is the greatest medicine maker ever. The Countess also witnesses the whole event and she offers Miss Apothecary a contract. Other hunters rush her with different titles and demands for her elixirs. To be on the safer side, Miss Apothecary then tells them that Gong Ya gets to decide whom she will sell her portions to. The librarian then checks their readiness and he warns them again about dying in the apocalypse. After the librarian is done talking, Gong Ya tells him to send them into the veritable records right away. Viper's clan then brings their master into the spotlight because they feel he should also be among them. But all the slots are filled it's left for someone to step down for him. The attention moves to Sword Saint as he is the one they think should step down. Paladin persuades the Sword Saint and in the long run, he decides to step down for Viper. Following the whole saga of who is stepping down for Viper, the librarian confirms the King of Death, Viper, the Medicine King and Miss Apothecary as the four new characters of the veritable records of Heavenly Demon. It's snowing in the martial art world when they get there. Gongya quickly advises them to draw their auras and protect themselves but the Medicine King and Miss Apothecary haven't learnt aura yet. In order to overcome the freezing cold, Gongya and Viper support them by sticking with them such that their auras flow around them together. Gongya holds Miss Apothecary's hand while Viper backs the old man. Then they move through the snowy ground in pursuit of their mission. Miss Apothecary sees people ahead and she quickly notifies the rest. 
They move close to these people and they discover that they are already frozen. Now they switch positions. Gong Ya and Viper have done a role of helping Miss Apothecary and Medicine King overcome the coldness so it's their turn now to help them know what's wrong with the frozen people. The two of them examine the frozen corpses and they give their options thereafter. Miss Apothecary confirms the date of death of one of the frozen corpses to be two years and three months while the Medicine King says they died of an unregistered illness. The frozen corpses situation confuses all of them. Gong Ya then tries to see the character of one of the corpses and it blanks out. They remain confused about what kind of grave is that. Suddenly, Gong Ya hears a distant voice. A man and a lady argue about the demonic cult's rule over the heavens. The man and the lady lambast each other. Both of them have done bad to the other so they keep blasting each other. As these two people abuse each other, Gong Ya tells them to sneak closer to them. The man belongs to the orthodox faction while the lady belongs to the demonic cult, and the cult's rule has led to disasters in their world. To cut the long story short, the man says he will cut the lady's head into two and offer half to the Jade Emperor and the other half to the King of the Underworld. They then start to talk about the wooden stick in their hands instead of their lethal weapons. The lady claims her own is a wooden sword and it contains the essence of a thousand years of the demonic cult. These two can never stop abusing each other, they continue to blast each other. Suddenly, the weather changes and the man begins to blame the lady for bringing her there on a bad day. Meanwhile, Gong Ya and the rest watch the whole scene. By the time both of them brace each other side by side in preparation for a serious battle, they begin to ask themselves what is happening. They eventually look back and they see zombies running aggressively in their direction. That is when they know that the extreme pandemic was a zombie virus. And that's how the second part of this man wins. Well guys if you like this video and you want a third part, comment below with the word hunter. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. But most important, leave a comment. Until the next video.